orthoplasty, oncology and teaching. He is a very well known teacher and a PG examiner in, in the southern part of India. We welcome you, sir. Good afternoon to you all. Respected uh, chairpersons, President of the Indian Orthopedic Association, SKS Maria, Honorable Secretary Sudhir Kapoor. Even though I'm quite used to, to be taking a challenge of giving a lecture without any preparation, it came as a so surprise that when I left this morning, uh, about 8 o'clock, I was not aware that uh, I would be honored by giving an eponymous lecture this morning. Anyway, I am delighted to be here and I feel honored to be giving a lecture on behalf of the honor of uh, Professor Natarajan. I have two connections with him. I've been to his house several times for uh, enjoying the refreshment of tea as well as the hospitality with my uh, good old friend, Mayal Nadarajan. So I have great pleasure to be here giving a lecture on his behalf in his honor. Professor Nadarajan was born in the year 1920 and has lived as a doyen and teacher of orthopedic surgery in the southern states as well as the whole of India and he left us in the year 2005. I came to realize that uh, he was working in the Madras Medical College as professor and head of the department for nearly 19, 19 years from the year 1957 to 1975. He had various uh, fields of interest, not only orthopedics, physical medicine and rehabilitation. And uh, it is proud to know that uh, Madras Medical College uh, has been risen to the postgraduate level uh, with his effort, he only started the MS Orthopedics Diploma as well as uh, Diploma in Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Uh, he was uh, responsible for starting the Artificial Limb Center in Tamil Nadu and Madras Medical College. And uh, he has developed not only the uh, Pioneer Institution, but also has been responsible for developing uh, orthopedic facility uh, all over the uh, Tamil Nadu in the district hospital levels and uh, um, I have great pleasure to give you this uh, uh, lecture on behalf of uh, Professor Narajan. I was not sure uh, what I should be talking but uh, uh, I realized that uh, his son who took up the mantle of his uh, field of interest uh, on tumors affecting the skeleton. Uh, he has great interest in bone tumors. Uh, I thought that it will be a befitting tribute to him if I take a subject which is uh, closer to his heart as well as his son, Mail Narajan. So I will be spending my next few minutes uh, talking about uh, uh, about some basic aspects of bone tumors. I'm not sure that uh, those of you who are actually sitting uh, is not familiar with what I am going to be talking about. But as we hear several times, there will be at least one person among the audience who has not been able to 
make his or her judgment on bone lesion when he is confronted on his own. So I will go down to the level of uh, talking about looking at a bone lesion and how to look at this in an informed manner. I'll just right away show you these x-rays. This is uh, an x-ray of the lower femur, both sides, and this is the tibia, tibia, and... Uh, uh -huh. Can you make up your mind? Uh, What is the uh, clinical impression about these conditions? Clinical impression, I will put up for about one, two, three, four, five, six x-rays. May be difficult, uh, some problem. While you are thinking about, you and I may be differently thinking about what should be the way to look at an x-ray. I have my own approach. You have your own approach. None of us may be uh, correct approach is actually familiar to us. So diagnosis is always important for a correct management as well as for an informed judgment of follow-up. The first picture is the clinical impression of a 24-year-old female and the diagnosis was considered to be giant cell tumor. The second picture is of a 21-year-old female and also was considered to be a giant cell tumor. And a 17-year-old female, an upper tibial lesion of that level that was also clinically diagnosed as a giant cell tumor. A 35-year-old woman, with a painful proximal radius, and this was considered to be a clinical diagnosis tuberculosis. This is a very interesting problem. I can't forget about my teacher, Professor K. Venugobaran Nair, the very first day when I joined as a active lesion of a one-year, six-month-old child. Nobody can complain that the diagnosis could be uh, far away from the truth. The clinical impression was uh, chondromyxoid fibroma or enchondroma. Clinical impression were chondromyxoid fibroma. I have some problem with that. All but one proved to be wrong after biopsy. Of the six x-rays, all the f six x-rays were diagnosed wrongly except one diagnosis. So what is the message? Do not act on clinical impression alone. It is wrong, at least as on today, that uh, acting on a clinical impression is not the right thing to do. What to depend upon then? Is there anything which you can depend upon? I will give you a story of a female whom we have treated last year. This is a lady who was working in the Gulf as a nurse. She had an MRI and an X-ray which was brought to India and Kerala. She was operated upon with the diagnosis of a cartilaginous lesion, benign lesion, chondromyxoid fibroma on an MR report and uh, this was actually done. This was curated out and uh, as a protective, this type of an implant was put in without a biopsy. Is it right? Is it right? Is it right? But uh, unfortunately, the diagnosis was wrong. The treatment also was wrong. Diagnosis of histological examination of the specimen count to be 
uh, grade 2 chondrosarcoma. So she has to undergo approximal humeral resection because of its contamination, it's extra compartmental resection and, and the humeral processes. This is an, another interesting problem. A 48 year old lady who was actually coming down from a bus, she suddenly felt pain in his proximal leg without any history of fall. This was an x ray, a lytic lesion, and the proximal tibia. An MRI is taken. And that is the MR picture. And the possibility of a low-grade chondrosarcoma with the chondromyxoid fibroma was considered as the MR diagnosis. Because of the diagnosis was confirmed by a radiologist, they have referred, they have attempted a needle biopsy. The needle biopsy did not produce any result. It could aspirate only blood. So the diagnosis was wrong because the her alkaline phosphatase was very high, her calcium was 14, phosphorus was reduced. The diagnosis is obvious. Her parathyroid hormone was sky high. So the diagnosis was wrong and it proved to be hyperparathyroidism. This is a very, very interesting point. This is an X-ray of a um, boy who was 21 at the age of uh, six months down the line with the symptoms of aching pain in the proximal uh, knee as well as in the lower femur. He underwent the MR picture imaging. That was the MR picture. What do you think about it? It is diagnosed as a chondromyxoid fibroma is a possibility. With that diagnosis, uh, the patient was uh, taken to one of our leading medical colleges, totally depending upon the uh, MR report, the surgeon opened it up, cured it up, and was planning to do a bone grafting. Fortunately, it was stopped because the appearance was not typical of a chondromyxoid fibroma. He stopped at blood level without doing any further surgical exercise and the biopsy report came as osteosarcoma. The message is do not act on image. X-rays or images are photographs only. They can be very deceptive and a clinical impression alone is not sufficient to have a correct diagnosis and the correct management or an informed follow-up. An oncosurgeon and radiologist is, and pathologist always sit together to make some decisions. But a different approach has to be taken for taking a bone lesion to be correctly managed. What is the different approach you should look? Look at this x-ray, what can you observe? What can you observe? There are lytic lesions in the ischium, in the proximal femur, in the base of the neck of the femur. Destroying the lesion, the bone is being destroyed at these places. Two post symbol, I now put it to you, those who are not familiar of looking at the bone x-rays, I put it to you, with two simple rules to observe to make a correct starting to a looking at a, a bone lesion. Two simple rules. Rule number one, what is the lesion doing to the bone? What is the lesion doing to the bone? Rule number one. Rule number two, what is the bone doing to the lesion? If you can strictly adhere to these two very, very simple rules, and observe carefully this observation. In most of the situations, you will be in the right track to make a clinical diagnosis which cannot be far away from the truth. What is the lesion doing to the bone? First of all, what is the lesion doing to the bone? In the previously shown x-rays, you could see that what is the lesion doing? Destroying the bone. Symbol. The lesion is destroying the bone there 
destroying the bone here and destroying the bone at the base of the neck. That's what the lesion doing to the bone. What is the bone doing to the lesion? What is the bone doing to the lesion? The lesion is actually destroying the bone at the whole visible space, ischium, proximal femur, and base of neck. The bone is doing nothing. The bone is either doing nothing or unable to do anything. So that the, either the bone is not doing anything, is unable to do anything. So the points to consider from these two rules, the lesion is destroying the bone, the bone is not doing anything. So the appearance of the lesion is a clue almost directly related to the behavior of the lesion. That will be good enough information to make a judgment about what is the right diagnosis. At the location of the lesion, the matrix, the zone of transition, number of lesions can be added on to increase the possibility of a correct diagnosis. But the appearance of the lesion in itself will be sufficient to make a correct di diagnosis in the right direction. Appearance of the bone can be divided into the pattern of bone destruction, the bone and periosteal response, the content of the matrix, and the expansion and dissolution of the cortex. All put together, I am sure in 95 to 99% of situation, you will be in the right diagnosis. Pattern of dis bone destruction can be described in three forms. Geographic, moth eaten, or permeative. This will give you an insight into the type of lesion we are dealing with. Give some examples. A geographical lesion, typically that will be the appearance. What does it do? Destroying the destructive lesion with sharply defined border. Very sharply defined border, but it is destructing the bone. There is a very sharp narrow zone of transition. The transition from the lesion to the bone is sharp. Why is it sharp? Less aggressive lesion and slow growing lesion. The bone is given sufficient time to react to the aggressive lesion. If there is a geographical appearance, sharp zone of transition, the lesion is not that aggressive. So you can be say there, if the lesion is destroying, the zone of transition is sharp and the, uh, definitely demarcatable, the lesion can be benign. The possible examples, the most common examples of a geographical lesion in a bone, mostly un, uh, skeletally immature, or young adult patient, non-ossifying fibroma, eosinophilic granuloma, chondromyxoid fibroma, cortical fibrous defect. Most of the lesions will produce that type of an appearance. On the contrary, here is a lesion which is actually destroying with a small pathological fracture, an extensive area. There is no zone of transition. The lesion is destructing different or an extensive part of the bone. Areas of destruction with the ragged borders indicate a more aggressive process. Expression of malignancy is that usually the case. Most eaten exam uh, examples are myeloma, metastasis, lymphoma, and Ewing sarcoma. A permeative, instead of you know, the whole medullary cavity is actually involved. That is a permeative lesion. Ill-defined lesion spread throughout the marrow spaces, wide zone of transition are features of definitely malignant lesion. Permeative lesions are destruction. Examples are lymphoma, myeloma, Ewing uh, sarcoma, and sometimes aggressive osteomyelitis. Pattern of dis bone destruction, 
A geographical bond destruction is indicative of a benign lesion. A moth eaten or permeative bond destruction is suggestive and almost always proved to be a malignant lesion. Rule number two, what is the bone doing to the lesion? Look at the following uh, features, periosteal reaction, zone of transition, the matrix, the site and number. Periosteal reaction, if it is a benign lesion, there may be no periosteal reaction or if it is present, it is usually solid periosteal reaction. None, here is a no, no periosteal reaction is seen. No periosteal reaction. Here there is a florid periosteal reaction and it is very solid or a mature periosteal reaction. Typical of osteodosteoma or uh, uh, brodysepsis. More aggressive malignant lesion, laminated or onion peel appearance, sunburst appearance, or Cotman's triangle. That is uh, onion peel appearance, multiple layers of parallel running newborn formation, or a sunburst appearance, they run the newborn formation is around or along the periosteal blood vessel because the periosteal blood vessels are right, right angles of the shaft of the bone, they produce a sunburst appearance. And uh, Cotman's triangle is the newborn formation at the junction of the lesion converging or joining the parent host bone. All these are features of a malignant lesion. Cotman's triangle, sundry appearance, and onion peel appearance are a malig malignant tumor, typical of osteosarcoma. The content, the matrix, the substance of the lesion, it can be differently than an osteoblastic lesion is is indicative of a newborn forming lesion in an young adult or adolescent, it represents an osteosarcoma type lesion matrix. That's the lady who you saw in the previously, this is a female, the cartilaginous lesion in a skeletal immature patient occurring in the 30s or 40s or in the 50s is suggestive of a central chondrosarcoma. A cartilaginous lesion of this nature in an adult should always be considered either a grade 1 or grade 2 chondrosarcoma. Grade 3 chondrosarcomas are usually more extensive lesions. Expansive lesions such as multiple myeloma, METS, brown tumor, enchondroma, aneurysmal bone cyst, and fibrous dysplasia. This is an expansive lesion which is affecting in the rib. This is a, a very expansive, rapidly growing lesion in the ileum, most typical of renal metastasis. And also, multiple lesions in the skeletal immature patient always look for lesions elsewhere in the five most commonly affecting primary uh, malignant tumors. In the male, a prostate. In the female, the breast, thyroid, lungs, uh, renal tract or kidney, and gastrointestinal tract should be encountered. Typically, the matrix is which is empty with only spicules of calcification, unlike the fluffy, extensive calcification indicates uh, in the small bones, metatarsal, metacarpal, or phalanges, almost always it is actually enchondroma. This type of diffuse involvement of the medullary cavity without involvement of the periosteum for a long time may be an indication of a diagnosis of brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism. This is a typical case which was referred as a patient with uh, uh, osteosarcoma uh, with pathological osteoclastic osteosarcoma with pathological fracture because of the diagnosis was concerned because the patient was only 17. I, it was proved to be a, a neurismal bone cyst. It can be confusing in the skeletal because it is an epiphyseal metaphyseal region. Uh, site of lesion epiphyseal 
Most commonly, it is a giant cell tumor or a chondroblastoma. This is a skeletal mature woman where expansile lesion with very little periosteal newborn formation involving the epiphysis whole and metaphysis most likely to be a giant cell tumor. It was proved to be a giant cell tumor as well. Typical lesion in the radius. Metaphysial lesions are osteomyelitis, osteoid and osteo and chondrosarcoma. In the child below the age of 15, if it is ABC or simple bone cyst. This was typical pictures of osteosarcoma, epivacial mass. Diaphysial lesions are enchondroma and uh, Ewing sarcomas. Simple bone cyst is the uh, almost correct diagnosis if the child is below the age of seven or eight and the proximal femoral site is typical lesion of the, because of the site. This type of uh, lytic lesion which occurs in the head of the femur or the lower end of the femur most commonly is the site of chondroblastoma. This is a usual site for giant cell tumor. Tibial diaphysial lesions are uh, typical sites for uh, dementinomas lesion, expansial lytic with periosteal reactions. Uh, typical site of uh, chordoma, never, whatever may be the imaging techniques and the reports comes, never jump into a diagnosis. Never ever, we have come across uh, last week itself three, four cases where the clinical diagnosis and the, uh, the imaging diagnosis were totally wrong. So always act only with the uh, uh, biopsy, a tissue diagnosis must be the order of the day, at least in the present time. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I, uh, with great uh, privilege, dedicate this uh, presentation, even though it came as a surprise to late Professor M. Nadarajan, and uh, I have great uh, honor to tell the Indian Orthopedics Association to ask me to deliver this eponymous lecture for a, a legend in orthopedic surgery, Professor Amandad Rajan. And I'm delighted to see Mile here sitting. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful talk about, particularly about the plain endura features of the bone tumors. We are obliged with your talk, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now we'll go to the next uh, uh